and the eternal seed. Tukam kroti bajalam pandam ramaya tegi in the pipatam mande shri dhinjina pandam. So the first word of this verse is Gatir, which means go, as Shiva Prabhupada writes in his explanation. Gati means the destination where we want to go. So the Srimad Bhagavatam explains Yashcha Mudatamo Loke that there are those persons in this world who are Mudatama, which means they're very foolish. And they have no desires to go anywhere else. They believe that they have achieved already the goal, existence in this material body, uh, life in this material world. A life which is aimed only at sense gratification. And they think that this is enough, there is no need for inquiring into anything beyond this. So in a sense, these persons are happy. In a sense. Actually, what is that happiness? It is the happiness of the animals. See, an animal certainly suffers. Uh, we see when we go to India especially, uh, it's a bit different than here because people in India are not so sympathetic to dogs like the people in Western countries who make dogs their best friends and keep dogs in the house, feed dogs from the same plate they eat from, and so on. <laughs> this is not considered culture in India. Rather, the dogs are considered street animals. So <coughs> the dogs running on the street, um, they, of course, have to find their own food. And in doing that, they may fight with one another or otherwise become injured. So one often sees an Indian dogs running on three legs and dogs with sores on their bodies and things like that. They're in an injured, suffering state. But yet, the dogs, because they're dogs, they go on with their business of being dogs to the very end of their strength. No run, three legs, two legs. <laughs> They'll continue to run and follow their nose to food and to sex and to shelter and so on. So even though certainly these dogs are aware that they're suffering, at the same time they're satisfied being dogs. Unlike, for instance, human beings, or at least we should say some human beings, who when they um, are faced with some obstacle in their life, some suffering, uh, whatever the suffering it may be, a disease or psychological suffering, then their whole life goes into a crisis. And they don't know what to do anymore. And uh, sometimes they go for psychiatric help or they take to drinking or something, but their whole life changes. They stop being whatever they were. They quit their job or they can't go on with their job and they're fired them. So we see human beings generally, that this is the meaning of human life, that a human being is dissatisfied. He should be, he should be dissatisfied. Of course, this verse I'm quoting in Srimad Bhagavatam is saying, yes, cha. Uh, so this verse is saying that um, there are those who are satisfied in this world like the animals. And then there are those who are yascha budhi parangata. They have attained this Gataha means again, gati. They have attained the supreme goal. 
So they are also happy. They are happy. But they are actually happy. Because they are situated in their uh, transcendental consciousness, their original spiritual consciousness, above the sufferings of this body. So those persons, the transcendentalists, are actually happy. The very ignorant people are apparently happy. If you ask them, if you ask them, do you want more in life? Do you, are you looking for something beyond this? They will say, no, I'm, everything's all right. I'm happy to make things up. But that is animalistic happiness. And then, so this is two classes of men. And then there's a third class. Klishanti. Uh, Ontorito uh, Jana. They're between. And they experience suffering. They're not settled in their position. Neither can they accept simply life as it is in this body with all the attendant sufferings, old age, disease, and death. This disturbs them. But neither have they achieved a higher understanding, a spiritual understanding of life. So particularly these persons, which is actually, that classification is meant for all human beings. If one is simply satisfied with the existence in this body and does not inquire into the purpose of life, then actually from a Vedic point of view, from the point of view of Shastra, the person is not a human being. He's called Dvipada Kashi. He's a two-legged animal. So Veda is not for animals. Animals, just like we're giving lecture by Bhagavad Gita, but no animals have come, no <laughs> dogs are here, no birds have flown mm -hmm. to you. They're not interested in these subjects. They're interested only in eating, sleeping, sex, and self-defense. So even if one may have a human body, but if his whole attention is focused on those things, these fourfold animals activities. And he has no interest in anything beyond. He's also considered animal. So actually a human being is one who's not, he's not satisfied with that. He wonders if there's anything beyond. He wonders what is the real purpose? What is the real goal <coughs> of life? So Krishna here is giving the answer. Gatir, I am the goal. Bharata Prabhu Shakshi, I am the sustainer, the master, the witness, the abode, the refuge, the most dear friend. So someone who comes to know this, that Krishna is the goal, then as we were saying, he achieves real happiness. Now what do we mean by real happiness? The word in Sanskrit is Sukha. So this Sukha is not sense pleasure, nor is it, is it even a mind pleasure. It is not, these are coverings, coverings of the real self, the soul, the gross physical body, the subtle mind. So materialistic, people who are materialistic, they try to find pleasure on these levels. But this real happiness, real sukha is in Bhagavad Gita, sixth chapter, it is explained to me simply the truth. It is the truth. Sukkam ayantikam yattad buddhi grahyam patindriya veti yatra chayvayam stiti chalatata so one who has attained this happiness, sukkam, akam, this transcendental happiness, then he is established, this chalati uh, tattvata, he is established in the truth. He's never moved 
from the truth. He's very, he's completely satisfied with reality. But what is reality? That's the question we have to ask. He's completely satisfied with reality. Reality means with himself as soul, as eternal spirit soul. He knows that this knowledge is the position of actual happiness. The guy exists eternally, beyond the changing of body, beyond the changing of mind. And with me eternally exists my goal, my dearest friend, Sukri, Sri Krishna. Krishna explains elsewhere in Bhagavad Gita uh, that Savasya Chahum Kridi Sanivish, that I dwell in the heart of all living beings. I am there. He says the soul is there. The real self, the soul, is existing in the heart. And mind and body are covering that soul. So along with the soul and the heart is Krishna, is Paramatma, super soul. So one who's attained this real happiness, he's satisfied in his transcendental existence. Now in the material state of consciousness, where we're accepting the self to be the body or the mind or both, we are not satisfied with the way things so. are. Just compare it and look at this question psychologically. A person who's accepted the body as the self, the false external designation. He thinks that that is real, that's the reality. He's never satisfied. He's always thinking uh, that I need more money, I need more pleasure in life, I need a change, I, I need more recognition, I need more sex, I need this, I need that. And that's his mind is a turmoil, huh? constantly. And, and uh, his, uh, yes, his existence is a great contradiction. Because of course, in material life, we try to present ourselves as being satisfied. That's, that's to keep up the image, the egotistic image that I'm on. So, yes, I'm happy. But inside, so many unfulfilled desires are bubbling away, causing us so much distress. And then, therefore, people, they try to dull these inner desires by, especially nowadays, by intoxication, by drinking, by drugs, to forget the dissatisfaction. So this is a great conflict. So people are not satisfied with the way things are. They're not satisfied with the truth. Of course, it is not the truth. That is the point. The problem is, is that they have accepted something else as the truth. Something else as themselves. The body. Or the mind. And actually, according to Shastra, that is simply a dream. This is the example given. Uh, anything that is happening in time, this is a statement from Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhutta Bhava Vishyatcha Suttam Sarva Rahoraha. Sarva Rahoraha means the secret of all secrets. The secret knowledge of the Vedic Shastra is Bhutta Bhava Vishyatcha. That anything that takes place in past, present, and future. Anything in time is sukta, is a dream. So now, let us try to understand this point. Just like at night we dream. We go to sleep. Sleep is a state of unconsciousness. And then after a few minutes, we begin to dream. And while we're dreaming, we're accepting these experiences as real because we react emotionally to them. If in our dream there is a, a threat, say someone is attacking us, then we feel the corresponding emotions of fear, and even you can feel pain if you're in your dream, you're beaten by 
someone, attacked by someone, he would even feel pain. So while it is happening, we accept it as real. We react emotionally to it. But then this experience passes away. It passes through the three phases of time. Buddha, Bhava, the Shishcha. Past, present, future. And it's gone. We wake up. <coughs> and then we laugh. Oh, it was just a dream. No man. I was very afraid. But now I can see. Just a dream. Just a dream, you say. So now dreams, they have, they do have a sort of reality. Um, they're psychological phenomena. The, the dream is actually, the dream state is actually a subtle world according to the explanation of the Vedas. It's a subtle state of the three, what are called the three modes of nature. Sattva, Rakas, Tamas. The three modes are explained here in Bhagavad Gita very extensively. But uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I just want to say that the three modes correspond with the three phases of time. So Rajas, passion, this is the mood of creation. And sattva, goodness, is the mode of maintenance, present, present existence. Just like this body, it was created in the past. Now it is being maintained. And in the future, <coughs> alive, it will be destroyed. And that happens by tamalu, <coughs> mode of ignorance. And as you may know, those who are perhaps a little familiar with the Hindu religion, and you know their presiding deities over each of these modes, Brahma, over Raja Guna, Vishnu over Sattva Guna, and Shiva over Tamu Guna. So, uh, dreams, this is like, as I said, subtle world, which is also passing through the phases of time. Creation, maintenance, and destruction. And similarly, this gross world is passing through the same phases. This body is created, maintained, and destroyed. This universe, the whole universe, is created, exists for some time, long time, and then is destroyed. So just like from the, our waking position, our waking situation, we look upon a dream as a, an illusion. We laugh, oh, yeah, it was just a dream, ha, oh, oh. But then we're, we've awoken to the gross physical platform of existence and we're accepting that as reality. But there is a state beyond this, uh, the transcendental state, the state of the liberated spirit, Brahma Buddha, in which one sees this state of consciousness, this embodied state, thinking that I am this body and that this world around me is the reality. One sees that as a dream. One sees this whole universe as a dream. And why is it a dream? Because it passes through the three phases of time. This is the way knowledge. Buddha, Bhava, Abhishesha, Sutta, Sarva, Rahuka. Anything that is passing through the three phases of time, past, present, future, is a dream. So ultimately it has no importance to us as soul in our real identity. So one who comes to the state of Krishna consciousness, knowing Krishna as the goal, knowing that I am eternal, spirit soul, and the lotus feet of Sri Krishna are my eternal nivasa. Uh, nivasa here means abode, sharana, shelter. And he is my sukrit. He is my most friend. Then he views his whole, yeah, the whole material existence as nothing more than a passing dream. And therefore, he does not seek any happiness there. There is a, a verse, Titi, Shristi uh, Stiti Pralaya Sadhan Shakti Reva, Chareva Bhuvanani. Vivartha Durga. <coughs> so Durga is 
Jesus, the name of a goddess, Durga Devi. <coughs> so she is the mistress of the whole material existence. She is Prakriti, material nature personified. And she is Krishna Shakti. Chaiva Bhuranani Vibhartha Durga. It's Chana Rutam Apicha Chesha Chaisa. Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bhajan. So Govinda Sri Krishna, he is the original Purusha, the original personality of Godhead. And Durga Devi is his Shakti, <laughs> his energy, his potency. And she uh, conducts Shishti means creation, Stiti, maintenance, a life, destruction. The whole universe is going through these phases. And the whole universe is therefore said to be Chaya. Chaya means shadow. It is a shadow of the spiritual world. Just like you see when a shadow is cast in the daytime. The sun moves across the sky, this shadow changes. Uh, it changes in length according to the position of the sun. Finally, when the sun goes down, the shadow is gone because everything becomes dark. So just like that, this whole material world is a shadow or a reflection of the eternal transcendental reality, <coughs> the eternal spiritual world. And that is our actual gati, our actual goal. That is where we will find this happiness, which is the truth, the eternal truth. Everything that we are looking for here in the material world, in the name of happiness, is a shadow or a reflection of that truth. Just like we look for happiness in human relationships. And but who finds real happiness? because these human relationships are temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, people search and search and search looking for the one that they can love in life. They may or may not find that person, but even if they do, the boy finds a girl, the girl finds a boy with whom they can have a lasting relationship. But what is that lasting relationship? In a matter of some years, it will end. It must end. Everything in this world ends. So this is this is the world of shadows. There is no happiness in this world. If we take happiness as being truth, then there's no happiness. The happiness in this world is illusion. Something that is appearing to be happiness for some short time, then is gone. That's illusion. That's mine. True happiness is eternal happiness. And that is to be found in the spiritual world. The Lord Krishna is saying, I am the goal for one who desires true happiness. So this bhakti yoga process, which we follow in this Krishna consciousness movement, is a method. Everyone should kindly understand this because some people think of it as some sort of religious practice or some form of meditation or some form of escape or whatever they may think. But actually, bhakti yoga is the method for attaining true happiness. True happiness is within, within the heart, where the soul resides and where Paramatma resides. Simply we have to unlock our awareness of what we really are. And bhakti yoga is the method to do that. So this discipline that the devotees follow, it seems to some people to be some kind of unnecessary medieval austerity. Something from the Middle Ages. Why are these people following these principles as were followed by the monks and nuns of 500 years ago? 
They don't eat meat, they don't have illicit sex, they don't engage in gambling or intoxication. And they're simply chanting all day and performing ritualistic worship. What kind of life is this? We want to have fun. So if your fun is in the world of shadows, the so-called fun doesn't last. So these activities of the devotees, they may appear to be some archaic, outmoded uh, religious rituals, but no. Actually, this is a method of unlocking the happiness for which we're all anxious. Everyone is anxious. Unless you're an animal. <laughs> then animals are just satisfied with the way things are. So if we're not animals, if we're not actually satisfied with the way things are, if we're suffering from this conflict of what we are now and what we want, would like to be, then we should inquire into this process of bhakti yoga. So, especially this chanting. Uh, chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It is uh, the method to bring one into direct contact with Krishna. Krishna, by his infinite mercy, has appeared in the Nama Avatar, Lord Krishna. He appears in the form of his holy name. And if one chants the holy name, chants Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama best to chant the holy name with a little bit of understanding that this is Krishna. Of course, <laughs> even if one chants the holy name without any knowledge, there's benefit. But if one actually wants to unlock this transcendental taste, higher taste, spiritual ecstasy, then one should approach the chanting a little seriously, a little reverently, <coughs> understanding this is Krishna. And therefore, associated with this chanting, there are regulative principles which are to be followed to clear away obstructions from our relationship with Krishna in the form of his name. So when we clear away these, uh, these obstructions and chant the holy name of the Lord uh, and hear the holy name of the Lord and taste <coughs> the holy name of the Lord, then you can begin to know what is happiness, what is satisfaction. Just like it is stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam that tushti uh, pushti kshutapai when a hungry man is given food, then by eating that food, three things take place. Tushti uh, means he's satisfied. He becomes happy. You don't have to do anything else for him. He's a hungry man, you give him food. <laughs> you can also have some violin player standing by. <laughs> and you can, you know, other things, entertainment, jugglers, magicians. But that doesn't matter to him. It can be there all right. Or it cannot be there. But he's a hungry man, he's eating, he's satisfied. Tushti, pushti, and then he's nourished. He's nourished by his eating. And Chuttapaya, his distress is relief. He was distressed. His belly was growling. He was very hungry. Very disturbed by his hunger. But now he's eating, so he's satisfied. So these three things automatically take place. So similarly, when one chants the holy name of Krishna, then also Tushti, Pushti, Chuttapaya, the same thing happens in the spiritual sense, you become satisfied. As I was explaining, the satisfaction means Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma, as Lord Krishna says in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. By coming to the spiritual platform, seeing clearly the distinction between myself as soul and body and mind, Prasanatma, It's very nice to actually know 
without a doubt that I cannot provide. Because all danger, all fear, all misery, all pain in life originates from the body. Or the mind, it's another body. It's just a subtle body. So it is very satisfying to know. Now, when I say no, I mean to actually perceive it. Not just to think it, or to guess at it, or even believe it. But to directly know that I am not the body. Tushti brings satisfaction. Also, chanting Hare Krishna means pushti, nourishment. One becomes spiritually nourished, spiritually strong. Because there is maya, the illusion. The whole material world is predominated by illusion. Illusory happiness, illusory pleasure. So there is, of course, a great arrangement in modern Western civilization for capturing people's attention. Mm -hmm. uh, capturing people's attention by this illusory happiness. Television, radio, films, all this is maya. But it is very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. But when one chants the holy name of the Lord, one becomes spiritually strong. And one, even, even though the full power of maya <laughs> is pervading this world, bewildering everyone, one who chants the holy name actually can become aloof to this attraction. You can't see it for what it is. It's just illusion. And then chuttapaya, chuttapaya means satisfaction of hunger. So in this world, we're all very hungry. We all have so many desires which we cannot satisfy, which we're struggling with, which give us so much trouble, embarrassment. But there are, by this chanting process, they're all, just like feeding the hungry stomach. They all become passive. So this is, a, this threefold experience, anybody here can have. It's a guarantee. I'm guaranteeing it. You can all experience this by chanting Hare Krishna. Of course, the thing is you have to do it. If you don't do it, then <coughs> don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> That's up to you. If you want to do it or not, it's another thing. But I will just remind you, closing this lecture on the same point I opened it with, that one who does not seek anything beyond the very meager pleasures of this material body and material mind. One who thinks, yeah, that's enough for me. It's called Nimudatma. It's called a fool. He's a person who doesn't actually warrant having a human body. He's not using the human body for what it's meant to be used for. So this is a great tragedy. Attaining this human form of life is very rare. It's a very rare opportunity for the spirit soul. So many, many, many spirit souls in this universe. And so few of them have human bodies. And it's only in this human form of life that we have the opportunity, as you are doing, to come here and sit down and hear the message of Bhagavad Gita. As I mentioned, dogs and cats and birds and mice and cockroaches and fish are not coming here to hear about them. Because their brains are completely programmed for only four things. Eating, sleeping, sex, and self-defense. That's it. They have no capacity for anything beyond that. No interest. So human beings have a kind of brain while at the same time we have to fulfill these four things just to maintain this body. There is some, to use some com computer language, RAM, random access memory. There's something <laughs> left over. <laughs> it's not all, all occupied by this uh, material program. There's something left over. And this is what is meant for. This is what that leftover human intellect is meant to be engaged in. The message of Bhagavad Gita, by which one can attain real happiness. When our brains are not engaged 
that, as you may know, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. Overintelligent human beings are very busy also in the same thing, the same search for pleasure. They're searching for higher happiness. But they're very busy using their uh, idle minds <coughs> to turn the world into a hell. That's the best they can do. They're meddling with nature, trying to squeeze out of this material nature uh, more <coughs> pleasure than they can get naturally. And all they're doing is ruining it. Making a big, big, big disturbance and bringing disaster upon themselves. <coughs> so this is this, this is a big waste of time. So if one wants higher happiness, more happiness than is available in this material body, then one should take that extra human <coughs> intelligence and apply it to understanding this message of Bhagavad Gita and putting into practice the method of Bhakti Yoga, which, as I said, fundamentally means simply to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Are there any questions? No? So is that anybody who wants? Yes, sometimes. We know from Srimad Bhagavatam that Maharaj Bharat, who was uh, practicing Krishna consciousness, but he was diverted, he became attracted to uh, a deer, a young deer. And he died thinking of that deer. So as a result, he took birth, his next birth, as a deer. But because he had developed himself spiritually. Therefore, he still had the remembrance of his previous life. So even though he was in the body of the deer, he used to go and attend classes. Classes on Vedic Shastra, Vedic knowledge. But this is very rare. Not common. So we'll make a plan based on this. <laughs> I wonder, um, is there some sort of attraction between nature and spirit, and spirit and nature? Because nature can't exist without spirit, isn't it? So, and uh, is there possibly some sort of attraction between spirit and nature? Yes, of course, there is an attraction. But and can we exist without uh, a body if we are spirits? 
Don't you need a body too? Yes, you need a body. But there are two kinds of nature. There's the material nature, which as I said is shadow. And there is the spiritual nature, which is the substance or the reality. So we as soul, we belong to that spiritual nature. But we're now hovering in the shadows. So this body that we have accepted, that the soul has accepted, cannot actually satisfy our spiritual desires. Because, well, one thing is simply because it is material, it's, it's dead matter, and we are living spirit. And another thing is that this body of dead matter is temporary, and we are eternal. So we uh, have to return to the spiritual nature. And that is done, again, by this process of bhakti yoga. Just as when we chant the holy name of Krishna, the soul is implanted in the spiritual nature by this process. It's compared to planting a seed, the soul as a seed in the garden, the garden of the spiritual nature, and the chanting is watering that seed. And then the seed develops. <coughs> Just as a seed in the garden grows up to be a flower or fruit tree or something. So similarly, the soul develops a spiritual body. The spiritual body is a body of <coughs> eternity, knowledge, and bliss. And this is the body with which we associate with and serve and love Krishna. And this is the body in which we can actually experience real happiness.